Good morning. My name is Winhouse Sun, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am an assistant professor here in uh, material science and engineering. I just started in January 2020, uh, and so I'm really excited to be here to share with you some of the research that I've done over the last year. The title of my talk today is The Interplay Between Thermodynamics and Kinetics in Solid State Ceramic Synthesis. Now, that might sound like a talk that you would hear from an experimentalist, but actually I am a theoretical and computational material scientist. So before I get started today, I'd like to share with you my perspective on how computation fits into material synthesis. So the very first thing that I learned as a material scientist is the synthesis structure properties performance paradigm. Uh, and in traditional material science, we like to think for, it goes from left to right, where I go to the laboratory and I synthesize a material. The way that I process it uh, results in a certain crystal structure and microstructure. And that structure imbues a material with certain properties that make it valuable for certain technological applications. Uh, computational material scientists, we like to think that we are inverting the material science paradigm, where we can specify an application a priori, and we have a good feeling for what kind of properties are needed to enable that application. And what we do is we search through thousands and thousands of structures uh, to find a structure that has those particular desired properties. And this is the this is the vision of the materials genome initiative where you know this is accelerated materials by design. But as you can see in this picture, uh, even if you know the structure property relationship and you know what structures are good, it doesn't necessarily mean you know how to synthesize that structure, right? And so what's really needed in my opinion to close the loop is predictive synthesis to understand how synthesis leads to certain structures. Now, if I were going to start to synthesize a new material, uh, traditionally, a good starting point is the thermodynamic phase diagram, right? Uh, we would consult a phase diagram and find a desired material that we'd like to make. And okay, so let's prepare the precursors at the target composition and carry the reaction out at a temperature where our desired material is stable. Uh, the expectation being that the precursors will go down in phase fraction over time and the equilibrium phase will grow in phase fraction over time. The reality is that when you do this, uh, indeed the precursors go down at the beginning, but before the equilibrium phase forms, we often get a series of non-equilibrium intermediate phases, uh, which can persist as impurity phases uh, in a reaction. And the problem with these non-equilibrium intermediates is that uh, because the thermodynamic phase diagram is the equilibrium phase diagram, these metastable phases are very difficult to anticipate. And so the guiding questions in this section are, you know, which non-equilibrium intermediates form uh, and why, and can we predict these metastable phases? Now, uh, you're probably not surprised to think to hear that non-equilibrium intermediates form because you just think, oh, it's kinetics, right? That's the whole second part of this discussion. So what comes to your mind when you think of the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics? What I think comes to most people's minds is this picture. Right? This is called the energy landscape, where the y-axis is the energy and the x-axis is the reaction coordinate. And a reaction can be thought of as a ball rolling along the energy landscape, uh, where the hills correspond to kinetic barriers and the valleys correspond to pure phases. And so the differences in the energy between the valleys uh, is thermodynamics. Does this sound familiar? Is this how you think about thermodynamics and kinetics? Uh, a lot of really great scientists uh, interpret uh, uh, chemical reactions as proceeding this way. So here are some papers that were published uh, very recently in the last few years uh, where they're analyzing uh, chemical reactions and solid state reactions uh, from this energy landscape description. What I'd like to do today is propose that the energy landscape description is not a very good starting point. It's not rigorous uh, specifically for solid state phase transformations. Uh, I'd like to start this discussion by talking about uh, the y-axis, okay? So if this were truly an energy eigensurface that connected all the different states, then the valleys are pure phases, so they have units of kilojoules per mole. But what are the units of the barriers? Well, actually, uh, kinetic barriers depend on the mechanism. So if you have a nucleation uh, transformation, then the barrier is energy per nucleus, okay? And so, you know, the nucleus can be 50 or 100 or 1,000 atoms, um, but the barrier uh, scales with uh, the number of atoms. Um, 
if it's a diffusion transformation, then a barrier is the energy per atomic hop. Okay. Now the problem is that energy is extensive, which means it scales with a number of atoms. And in a solid state transformation, uh, the number of atoms are not always conserved in the process. And what I mean is like, if I'm transforming one mole of material into another mole of material, well, if it's transforming by a nucleation reaction, uh, the nucleation part might only be uh, 50, 50 atoms uh, as the nucleation barrier. So you cannot put different units onto the same figure. And just to illustrate this a little further, uh, suppose you had these three materials. Uh, this is alpha manganese oxyhydroxide, which is metastable. And here are two lower energy uh, phases that can start from this. And so suppose that we had uh, this energy axis and this phase, which is the gamma manganese oxyhydroxide phase, this has a different structure than this phase. And so it can only transform through a nucleation reaction. Uh, on the other hand, this material, manganese O2, uh, is basically a dehydrogenation reaction from this compound. Uh, but if you look at the crystal structure, it's topotactically uh, the same structure. So suppose I gave you the activation energy barrier for nucleation and also the activation energy barrier for hydrogen diffusion. Could you say which one of these reactions dominate? No, you can't, right? Because like I said, they have different units. They're, they're normalized differently. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why on the energy landscape picture, you cannot put the energy barriers on the same figure as the pure phases. The second major problem of the energy landscape picture is that the x-axis is not precise, right? What is the reaction coordinate? <laughs> this is the first question that I asked when I saw this figure in Gen Chem uh, as, a, as a freshman undergrad. Um, you know, if you ask different scientists, they'll tell you different things, right? Sometimes it is time. Uh, if you are in the catalysis community, this is often used to represent molecular configurations. Uh, and some people even describe it as different experimental conditions. They describe this as temperature or pressure. The problem is that uh, because it's such an imprecise definition, uh, if you cannot say what it is, then as a computational material scientist, I cannot reliably calculate it, right? So, you know, both the energies and the x-axis uh, are, are not a good starting point for predictive material synthesis or describing the non-equilibrium intermediates. So what is rigorous? Um, you know, if you think about the transformation from a precursor to a target phase, you always start from a high energy metastable state and you transform to an equilibrium phase. And so from a thermodynamic perspective, what that is, is the thermodynamic driving force, right? And so on Gibbs free energy curves, uh, this looks like this. If you have like AB being transformed into some compound AB, uh, some binary material AB, uh, the driving force is the difference in energy between this tie line and the target material. Or, this is in, this is in an extensive axis, or in a intensive axis like temperature and pressure, uh, the driving force of transformation is from the metastable state uh, to the equilibrium state. And this value, the thermodynamic driving force, plays into kinetics directly. Uh, when we think about materials kinetics, we can very broadly break it down into diffusion, uh, nucleation and growth, right? And so if you look at these, uh, these equations for kinetics, uh, all of these terms correspond to this thermodynamic driving force. So thermodynamic driving force is a really important quantity uh, for phase transformations. Uh, but unfortunately, you cannot get this quantity from phase diagrams, right? Phase diagrams don't have an energy axis. And so what we really need to do is we need to take these phase diagrams and look at uh, the third dimension, this energy dimension, uh, to really start to quantify driving forces between metastable precursors to the target equilibrium phase. Okay, so we're going to talk today about solid state ceramic synthesis. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know how this works, this is, uh, you know, me as a theorist <laughs> describing the process of solid state synthesis. Um, so the first step is mechanical mixing. And so this can be taking your powder or taking your precursors and grinding them into a powder. You can do this either in a uh, in a mortar and pestle or in like a ball mill. So here, this is a rotary ball mill where where really hard uh, zirconia balls or tungsten carbide balls uh, grind up your precursors, and then you take your powders and you put it into this tube furnace. And so you can put it in a crucible in the middle. And so this is a this is a heater, and so it heats it up to you know 700 degrees Celsius and higher. 
Uh, in this tube, you can also flow gas. You can flow like oxygen gas or, or argon or whatever, whatever you want to as part of the reaction. And after you run this reaction for a while, you take the product phases and you characterize them uh, via x-ray diffraction. Uh, in solid state synthesis, oftentimes the reaction is incomplete after one of these cycles. And so you have to take your products and re-grind them and re-anneal them. And sometimes you have to do it several times in this process. The general intuition regarding ceramic synthesis is that because in powders, which are like micrometers or, or maybe a little bit smaller, but diffusion distances are very long, right? Several, several hundred thousand angstroms. Um, and what that means is that uh, we want to facilitate diffusion kinetics. And so you have to go to very high temperatures. And even when you go to high temperatures, uh, you often need to synthesize for many, many hours from like, you know, six hours to sometimes even 72 hours. What I'm going to show today is that a lot of this intuition uh, is actually not, necessar not necessarily true. Um, uh, reactions can be very fast. Uh, if you design the precursors and the reaction conditions in a very special way. And the way that I'm going to demonstrate this today is uh, through a combination of experiment and computation. So I collaborate very closely with uh, many beamline scientists. And so uh, we use synchrotron radiation, which is very high powered uh, uh, x-rays um, to do in situ x-ray diffraction. And so we can see, you know, in a reaction vial, materials as they form in real time. And then what we do uh, from my side is we use computational material science and ab initio thermodynamics to develop an understanding of why materials grow and transform the way that they do. And if we can build general theory, then we can more cleverly design synthesis recipes to new materials. So I'm going to talk about three stories today. Um, the first one is a two precursor reaction between sodium peroxide and cobalt oxide to form this important sodium ion battery cathode, uh, sodium cobalt oxide. Then I will talk about a three precursor reaction uh, for forming the classic high temperature superconductor yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, and finally, I will talk about a metathesis reaction, which is also known as a ion exchange reaction to form magnesium chromium sulfide, which was computationally predicted to be a very compelling magnesium ion battery cathode. Okay? Okay, so let's get started uh, with the two precursor reaction. First thing I want to do is introduce kind of a conceptual way, a conceptual model to think about phase evolution. So consider uh, earlier when we were talking about this uh, at the microstructural level, these powder precursors, right? So I have here a heterogeneous mixture of precursor powders. And my question to you is, how do reactions proceed? Well, if I imagine these as like three dimensional grains, uh, well, the interfaces are the only places where reactions can initiate, right? The two dimensional interfaces. Like if I have A, B, and C, reactions will be much faster between A, B, B, C, and A, C than at the center point where A, B, and C all meet together, right? So initial reactions must occur at interfaces. Uh, and what that means is that reactions are pairwise, okay? And we can also hypothesize that the reaction extent uh, is proportional to the reaction free energy. And what I mean by that is like, if the A and B reaction is, is very exothermic and rapid, then this will, might dominate the reaction before B, C, and A, C can react. So the second question becomes, what is the phase that forms at the interface uh, between two precursors? And suppose I have the energy landscape here is A and B and, you know, in thermodynamics, you might remember something called the convex hull. The convex hull is uh, normally we would see parabolas here, but just to show the, the pure phases, let's pretend these are line compounds. Um, suppose these are three stable phases in the AB phase diagram. Which one will form at the interface? Uh, well, we can't say for sure, but we can conjecture that maybe the one with the highest reaction energy forms first. So that's the A2B phase or the alpha phase in this case. So we hypothesize that the compound that forms at this interface is the one with the most negative reaction energy in the AB convex hull. And an important thing to recognize here is even if my precursors start at a composition ratio of one to one, A to B, uh, the first phase to form might not be the composition of the starting precursors. Okay, and so let me provide an example for where this is a very relevant situation. 
So uh, sodium cobalt oxide is a candidate sodium ion battery material. And this material comes in two types of structures. Uh, it's often classified as the two layer structure and the three layer structure. And so these structures have, these polytypes have different names. It's called the P2 phase. And these are the P3, O3 prime and O3 phases. And these phases are easily accessible by sliding the planes relative to each other. However, in the P2 phase, uh, they cannot slide. And the problem of this, with this uh, polymorph in terms of the, uh, the battery performance is that because these can easily shift um, in layers, uh, you can often get battery degradation upon cycling. So you can lose performance in your battery if you cycle it a lot because you, you start building uh, defects in your system. So we would like to synthesize the P2 phase. Now, this is an ex situ synthesis uh, diagram. This is not a phase diagram. This is uh, people uh, this is people from our, my previous group. They would synthesize uh, uh, sodium cobalt oxide at different sodium concentrations and at different temperatures. And you know they would target different precursor ratios. And this is the primary phase that was observed during synthesis. Um, and so P2 was found to be the low sodium composition, high temperature phase. The surprising thing is that if you calculate their energies in density functional theory, which is a quantum mechanical theory, and I, I won't go into details about it, but um, it's a way to get the energies of competing phases. Um, the P2 phase is the stable phase, the low enthalpy phase, because it's DFT is a zero Kelvin method. Uh, the P2 phase is the low temperature stable phase, whereas uh, the P3 and the O3 phases are metastable at low temperature. And in fact, these are the stable phases at, uh, at the sodium one composition. So this question comes is that, you know, if P2 is predicted to be stable at zero K, then in principle at low temperature, uh, P2 should be the dominant phase at low temperature rather than P3 and what's called O3 prime. So why are P3 and O3 prime forming at low temperature? Well, to study this, like I said, uh, we go from what is normally a black box synthesis into the synchrotron beam line. So in the synchrotron, we put the reaction in a vial and we shoot a very high power laser through it, uh, X-ray, and you can see the X-ray diffraction pattern and you can take a, a, a scan every, every few seconds. And so here's what the data from those kind of experiments look like. And let's see what happens uh, in the phase evolution. So we're starting with cobalt oxide plus sodium peroxide precursor. And so here's the phase fraction of the uh, of the precursors. And this is a time axis. And so this is the number of this is the phase fraction over time. So what we see are kind of two different regimes. Um, the first one is that we have uh, non equilibrium three layer phases that are appearing uh, in the first 30 minutes. And so you have very fast reactions that happen in the first 30 minutes. And then after 30 minutes, uh, there's this very long reaction process where this, uh, this metastable P3 phase is slowly transforming into our desired P2 sodium 0.66 cobalt oxide phase. And uh, you, it's hard to see, but there's this little gray line right here. And this gray line is the temperature. And uh, to trigger this transformation at the end, you have to go to really high temperatures in order to facilitate this transformation. But otherwise, you would have a very slow polymorphic transformation. And what we did in DFT is density functional theory is we can calculate the grand potential free energy of the entire system as a function of reaction progression. And so here's what we see, okay? Um, here's the starting precursor, sodium peroxide plus cobalt oxide. And in this first reaction, which happens six minutes in, 85% uh, of the total reaction free energy is consumed in this first step, okay? And these fast transformations that occurred uh, in the first 30 minutes, these correspond to the consumption of the remainder of the reaction free energy. And by the time you get to this P3 sodium 0.6 cobalt oxide phase, uh, you only have about 2% of the total reaction energy left in the system. And then it begins this very, very slow transformation to the equilibrium phase. So the major question becomes, um, you know, we were preparing precursors at a sodium 0.66 composition, uh, but the first phase to form actually has a sodium one composition. And, you know, what is the origin of this first phase? Well, like I said earlier, we had this powder interfacial reaction model, and 
what the important thing to recognize is that the powders do not know the stoichiometry of the reaction vessel, right? They only know what they can see at the neighbors. And the solid state reactions initiate at the interface. And so what we can do instead of calculating the total energy of the entire reaction vessel, we can analyze uh, the reactions in the interface. And it's also kind of compositionally unbounded, right? Uh, you have, you know, a, a reaction that starts here has a sort of semi-infinite reservoir of sodium and cobalt to react from, um, at least, you know, from its local uh, atomistic uh, perspective. And so what we did is we calculated the reaction energies uh, at the interface with variable stoichiometries. And what we found is that the reaction energy that was the greatest was the reaction energy for forming the sodium one cobalt oxide composition. And like I told you earlier, at the sodium one oxide composition, cobalt oxide composition, the O3 phase was the stable polymorph. Okay? And so the conclusion that we're coming here is that the interfacial reaction, this reaction, determines the sodium one cobalt oxide composition, and this composition determines the O3 structure, which is because this is the lowest energy structure at this composition. And so if I go back to the phase diagram, or not the phase diagram, but the, the, this energy cascade, the way that I can rationalize this, uh, this, this phase evolution is that the O3 phase is the first phase that forms at the interface between sodium peroxide and cobalt oxide. Um, and then once I consume uh, this reaction and forming this sodium one composition, now I have leftover cobalt oxide in my system, right? Because it's not at the right stoichiometry. I was targeting a different stoichiometry. So uh, the rest of this energy is the reaction between excess cobalt oxide with sodium cobalt oxide, which effectively means I'm putting more cobalt into the system. And so I'm kind of reducing my sodium concentration with respect to cobalt. And so once this reduces, down to the sodium 0.6 composition. Now I'm kind of in the range of the equilibrium phase. And then, oh, sorry. Uh, so, you know, in this range when it's transforming, remember there was easy layer sliding, right? So these are all topotactic transformations between these metastable three layer phases. And, and finally, uh, once it forms at the proper composition, now I begin this polymorphic transformation. And in order to get this transformation, I had to go to very high temperatures and if you think about the uh, the reactions at this stage, this is very well described by a Verami kinetics, our JMAC model. Okay, so this is a uh, a two layer reaction. Uh, this was published in Nature Materials uh, earlier earlier this year. Uh, what about three precursors? So now I'm going to talk about yttrium barium copper oxide, and now the interfacial reaction becomes actually a little bit more interesting, right? Because now by having A and B and C, um, one, one interface might dominate the early stages of reaction. So I might get like A to A2B, and then these might react, and then I might get a reaction like so. So now we have a sequence of pairwise reactions which can dictate phase evolution. Okay, so the material that we're talking about now is yttrium barium copper oxide. Again, this was one of the most famous materials in the early uh, 1990s and the late 1980s. This was the first material to have a uh, superconducting, superconducting critical temperature above 77 Kelvin. And 77 Kelvin is liquid nitrogen, right? And so uh, this material really set off a, a crazy flurry of activity for high temperature superconductors. And uh, it is actually shown that it was, you know, there was this article that said it's actually pretty easy to make these uh, and schools in the United States make this material all the time. Um, and so there was a there was a recent YouTube video about making this material and it got like a million views in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so it's been synthesized a lot. But do we understand how it forms or why it forms? So the typical recipe for making YBCO is, is yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, involves Y2O3 plus copper oxide plus barium carbonate. And this reaction uh, takes about 12 hours at 900 and something degrees C. And you have to do a lot of regrinding and re-annealing because the reaction uh, is, is kinetically not very good. There was this very interesting paper. It's about a one page paper titled Synthesis, Superconductor Synthesis and Improvement, <laughs> where uh, it's just it's just like a one page paper that says uh, oh we replaced barium carbonate with barium peroxide, and we found that we could synthesize it in in one step in less than four hours, 
no discussion of why or whatever. It was just a, it was just like an undergraduate lab report. Um, and uh, it's kind of an intriguing observation, right? By switching out one precursor, you can make the reaction a lot faster. So we can calculate in DFT the reaction energies between these two phases. And uh, a, really, a really simple description is that barium peroxide is less stable than barium carbonate, right? Barium carbonate has to evolve CO2 when you heat it. Um, and so barium peroxide is a fairly unstable uh, oxide. And so the driving forces are the, the reaction energy from uh, Y2O3 plus barium peroxide plus copper oxide going to YBCO is much stronger driving force than starting from barium carbonate. Okay, but we should also think about the pairwise reactions, right? This is what I was talking about earlier. So here's what we did. We used in situ x-ray diffraction to watch the reaction uh, live in, 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 in the reactor. And uh, this is kind of a sideways x-ray diffraction plot. So I'm putting the two theta axis here on the, on the y-axis instead of the typical x-axis. And uh, we were increasing the temperature at a rate of 30 degrees C per minute. So this is only a 30 minute uh, synthesis reaction. And this is starting with the barium carbonate precursor. And the observation here is that uh, as you ran the reaction, uh, the barium carbonate uh, did a polymorphic transformation from gamma to beta barium carbonate, but actually barium carbonate uh, didn't really decompose in the reaction time that we started. Uh, because barium carbonate didn't decompose, uh, yttrium oxide and copper oxide started reacting and it formed some uh, minority Y2Cu2O5 phase. And like I said, this is usually a 12 hour synthesis. So the fact that we didn't see anything in 30 minutes is not really surprising. But what is surprising is when you start with the barium peroxide synthesis. Now barium peroxide decomposes at a very low temperature uh, around like uh, 650 C. And now we can see that barium peroxide actually reacts with copper oxide at a fairly low temperature and it forms this barium two copper 306 phase. And then this material goes through a, a series of decompositions uh, until it forms barium copper O2. Now barium copper O2 uh, melts at around uh, 900 degrees Celsius. And you can see that even before then barium copper oxide is reacting with Y2O3 to form YBCO. So I can synthesize YBCO not only in less than four hours, but I can synthesize it in 30 minutes through barium copper oxide intermediates. Um, and we can think about this from the pairwise reaction picture. Let's, let's t describe it from, from this sequence. Uh, the thing about starting with barium, copper uh, barium, cobalt, uh, barium carbonate sorry, is that if you look at all the pairwise reactions in that system, uh, the driving forces are not very significant in the entire reaction system. And especially because barium carbonate has to be decomposed, uh, a driving force of minus 100 kilojoules is, is not seem to be enough to go, get over that decomposition energy barrier. Um, so all the interfaces have kind of small driving forces and the most reactive interface, uh, which is the barium carbonate copper oxide interface, doesn't even happen uh, because barium carbonate won't decompose. And that's why you get this yttrium copper oxide phase. If I look at the barium peroxide reaction, okay, if I calculate the interfacial energies, barium peroxide and copper oxide have a very strong driving force to form barium two copper 306. And indeed, the largest driving force interface out of the three possible interfaces was the material that we saw, barium two copper 306. And uh, in situ XRD kind of tells us the, the reaction progression, but what's really cool is uh, to watch it in using in situ scanning electron microscopes to watch how it evolves in space and time, you know, spatiotemporal is a fancy word. So here is a video of that process. Okay, so this is the video of, uh, of the reaction from in situ TM and SEM. Um, what we have here to start out is an EDX plot. So the EDX plot uh, shows the elemental distributions throughout this initial particle. So copper is orange, barium is green, and yttrium is blue. And so what we see here is a particle that has, you know, kind of well-mixed uh, character. All the yttrium is right here. That's just for your reference. And we have dark field uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy and also scanning electron microscopy. Um, and you know we can only take EDX at room temperature, by the way. So that's so we'll have to watch the SEMs over time. Okay, so here is the reaction being overlaid um, against the in situ X-ray diffraction, and so they're being run at the exact same rate. So the transformation should be the same. So nothing's really happening uh, in the early stages, but then 
at about 430 Celsius, now you can see uh, a melting occur. Okay, This is a process where barium-2, copper-306, is being synthesized. You can see that this is uh, the reaction forming. Now remember, Y203 was kind of in the back here. It's this inert phase. Um, so that's the formation of barium-2, copper-306. And this material persists for a while. Um, and then as it goes to even higher temperature, uh, this kind of really cool reaction happens where uh, these bubbles start appearing. Uh, and you can kind of track the, the transformation to be barium-2, copper-306 decomposing to barium copper O2 plus copper oxide. So that's what these bubbles are. And remember, Y203 remains unreacted in this entire sequence. Um, and then once you go even higher in temperature, what we will observe is that the copper oxide and the barium copper oxide uh, start to melt. It starts to liquefy. And then as it liquefies, it gets sucked up into the Y203, which becomes yttrium barium copper oxide. So here's the EDX at the end of the at the end of the reaction. Uh, all the yttrium, barium, and copper is is sucked up into the material, and it's in here. This is yttrium, barium, copper oxide, and here's the yttrium. So you see the yttrium has not moved, but the barium and copper have have gone into the material to make YBCO. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. There it is. That, I think that's pretty fun. So we can rationalize uh, this observed phase progression by consulting the barium peroxide copper oxide phase diagram. So remember, the first starting point was uh, we formed this barium-2 copper-306 phase, uh, which as the increase in temperature, what happens is that barium-2 copper-306 undergoes this peritectic decomposition, this phase separation, into barium copper oxide and copper oxide. That was the formation of those bubbles, right? And the fascinating part of this particular phase diagram is that the eutectic temperature uh, between barium copper oxide and copper oxide is at about 890 degrees C. And so then that melting was the formation of this low temperature eutectic phase. And that, that liquid melt uh, then reacted with Y203, uh, which is not on this phase diagram, but off this phase diagram to give you YBCO. Uh, if we take the YBCO and then we cool it, uh, we can transition to the superconducting phase. This is kind of a well-known uh, observation. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but basically uh, the formed phase is in this tetragonal uh, construction. And then when you cool it, it goes into this orthorhombic phase, which is the superconducting phase. Um, and that's, so we do confirm that this material is indeed YBCO and that it is superconducting from measurements. The way that we can interpret this from the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics. Uh, so first, uh, let's not look at the details on this figure. I'm gonna explain to you what you're looking at. This is a figure that we invented uh, where we're putting the driving forces on the y-axis and diffusion rate on the x-axis. A little bit qualitative, but actually um, it's, it's quantitatively backed up. And we break it into what we call the thermodynamic regime <laughs> and the kinetic regime. So we first started with these three precursors and barium peroxide and copper oxide had the most favorable interfacial reaction, right? And so in the first reaction to form barium-2 copper-306, it consumes about two thirds of the total driving force. And once you get to this stage, you have fairly slow kinetics. And so if you wanted to go from here to the target phase, because you have slow kinetics, this would normally take a while, uh, take a long time, but there is a transformation to the eutectic melt, right? At 900 degrees C. And that gives you, even though you have small driving forces left, it gives you a lot of kinetic mobility to form uh, this yttrium oxide, barium copper oxide liquid. And because you have so much diffusion in the liquid state, uh, this facilitates, even when you have small driving forces left, this facilitates the rapid uptake of uh, Y203 and barium copper oxide, forming this yttrium barium copper oxide phase. And at low temperature, this material actually is metastable. It wants to decompose, but it can't because again, diffusion is limited. And so the only thing that can diffuse at this stage is oxygen gas. And so oxygen gas is uptaken and finally forms YBCO, the target superconductor. So this is our description of the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics in this reaction involving three precursors. Okay, I have just one last story. I'll, I'll try to make it fast. Uh, there's this material called magnesium chromium sulfide uh, that was identified from computational material science to be a, a very promising 
uh, magnesium ion battery cathode. It had very high gravimetric capacity and also uh, a good voltage uh, for chromium. And uh, some uh, the uh, from the Pobelmeyer group at Northwestern University, uh, they tried to synthesize magnesium chromium sulfide. Uh, it was a very laborious process. They started with magnesium, chromium, and sulfur elements. And what they found is that this reaction very quickly formed magnesium sulfide and chromium sulfide. But then this next process from magnesium sulfide to chromium sulfide to magnesium chromium sulfide, this took uh, over two weeks of synthesis. And the reaction had to be around 800 degrees Celsius because this material actually melts at 900 degrees. So you couldn't go to higher temperatures to, to increase the kinetics. And so they had to regrind and rerun the reaction over two weeks, very time consuming, very laborious reaction to form this material. Uh, if we look at the phase diagram, this is a ternary phase diagram, but I've actually added a color axis where the color axis is kind of the energy of the convex hull. Remember, this is how, how deep the driving forces are. And so if I look at sulfur, magnesium, and chromium, just like in the previous story we were describing, uh, the pairwise reactions in the sulfur direction happen very quickly. So you can very quickly get to magnesium sulfide and chromium sulfide. But then the reaction from magnesium sulfide to chromium sulfide, if I look along this direction, the driving forces are minuscule. So even though this is a stable material, it's barely lower in energy than the binaries. And we can calculate the reaction energy to be minus two kilojoules per mole. So very, very small driving force. We designed a new reaction. Um, and here's the precursors. It's sodium chromium sulfide plus magnesium chloride goes to magnesium chromium sulfide plus sodium chloride. And this reaction has a driving force of negative 47 kilojoules per mole. And the reason why this reaction is so much stronger driving force is because sodium and chlorine are separated in the precursor, but are recombined in the product phase. And so this reaction is being driven by this product formation. I just think that's so cool. Uh, uh, we also used uh, a flux in this situation. We use a KCl magnesium chloride flux. So uh, what this is, uh, remember previously we were talking about the liquid phase giving you a lot of kinetics, right? So a flux is a eutectic melt between two salts. So we picked, a, we picked the eutectic temperature between potassium chloride and magnesium chloride. Uh, and then we ran the sodium chromium sulfide through this, through this phase. And we were able to synthesize magnesium chromium sulfide at 500 degrees C in 30 minutes. Okay, uh, that is much better than 850 degrees C for two weeks, right? And also we were able to synthesize nanoparticles. So these are nanoparticles of magnesium chromium sulfide. They were between 100 and 200 nanometers. Normally when you do a two week synthesis, uh, particles will ripen, right? They will coarsen and uh, they will get really big micrometer size. But for batteries, you want a lot of surface area. And so this route not only can make it quickly, it can also make it uh, at, at nanoscale. We can now revisit the ternary phase diagram, uh, where instead of looking at the magnesium, chromium, and sulfur ternary diagram, we can construct a pseudo ternary phase diagram, which is between magnesium chloride, sodium sulfide, and chromium chloride. And remember, previously along this tie line, we found that the driving force to form magnesium chromium sulfide was tiny. In this new pseudo ternary phase diagram, we see that along the tie line between magnesium chloride and sodium chromium sulfide, uh, the reaction to form magnesium chromium sulfide is much deeper in energy. So the conclusion that I want to have for this kind of short section is that the ceramic synthesis route uh, is very long. It takes two weeks with regrinds and re at 850 degrees C. Metathesis enables us to do this synthesis in 30 minutes and at lower temperatures. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really cool and elegant method to do material synthesis. Uh, the pseudo ternary phase diagram uh, helps us to rationalize metathesis reactions. And kind of the last thing I want to end with is that these reactions are actually really easy to uh, evaluate using existing DFT thermodynamic data uh, in databases such as the materials project. Uh, you can calculate these uh, metathesis reactions. Uh, anyone can do this, uh, even if you don't do computation. And so uh, this is a really nice new conceptual framework to design reactions to, element, or to compounds that have otherwise very small driving forces. So I'm really excited and, and, and enthusiastic about these kinds of elegant metathesis reactions to new materials. Okay, 
So uh, that's uh, that's my talk. Uh, just to recap, we are using observations from in situ x-ray diffraction and also theory and, and energetic analyses to understand solid state synthesis better. Um, for, at the beginning, I argued that uh, if you want to better understand the interplay between thermodynamics and kinetics, it all comes from the thermodynamic driving force, right? Which is not readily apparent on phase diagrams. Uh, the thermodynamic driving force gives you the difference in energy between precursors and targets. And this driving force also plays into a lot of kinetic equations. One of the major takeaways was that the first reaction often consumes a majority of the total reaction driving force, right? And these reactions can happen very quickly. These reactions happen in, in a few minutes. This was a six minute reaction. And this first part happened in, in just about 20 minutes. And remember in the magnesium chromium sulfide case, when I used, started from the elemental precursors, it formed of magnesium sulfide and chromium sulfide almost instantaneously. But then the second step was extremely slow. Which comes to the next point, which is that when you have no more driving force left, when, you're, when you've consumed all your driving force, if you want to finish the reaction, you require kinetics, right? You need to find a kinetic mechanism. In uh, the sodium cobalt oxide case, uh, when there was very little driving force left, we had to go to higher temperature to increase the diffusion constant, right? Uh, and in YBCO, this only worked because we were able to form this liquid self-flux kind of uh, kind of system and this liquid phase had fast diffusion kinetics when you form magnesium sulfide and chromium sulfide in a in a, in a regular synthesis <laughs> there's no liquid and so you just have really bad kinetics that's a two-week synthesis when you have powdered precursors uh, just from the 3d nature of the way that gr precursor grains are uh, reactions will initiate only between two precursors at a time right they can only happen at the interfaces and the first phase to form uh, doesn't have to have the, the the stoichiometry of the reaction vessel it's it can instead just be the one with the largest driving force right and if you have three or more powder precursors then these reactions occur at the pairwise interfaces and then they proceed in a sequence of pairwise interactions uh, you can by more carefully choosing your precursors you can modify the thermodynamic driving forces and therefore the reaction kinetics, right? So in YBCO, we showed that by going from barium carbonate to barium peroxide, uh, you could trigger a whole series of transformations that occur at a lower temperature and also facilitate the formation of this uh, liquid melt. And in magnesium chromium sulfide, we showed that by separating sodium chloride in the precursors and rejoining them on the product side, uh, you can form this compound. Uh, and I didn't even say this earlier, but sodium chloride is super easy to remove from the products. You just wash it with water. This is soluble and this is not soluble. And so then you're left with phase pure magnesium chromium sulfide. Okay, so uh, what I hope everyone takes away from today's talk is that if we very thoughtfully consider these principles uh, of solid state synthesis, you know, both the geometry of pairwise reactions and also the interplay between thermodynamic driving forces and kinetic mechanisms is that we can move from this kind of description, this energy landscape description, which I argued is, is not very precise and not very computable. We can move from this kind of description, this conceptual idea to a quantitative and predictive computational foundation for material synthesis. Okay, so thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Uh, these are the papers that are associated with the three stories that I told today. The sodium cobalt oxide story is in Nature Materials. It was published earlier this year. Uh, the YBCO story is still under review, but you can read it on the archive. Uh, here's the title of that paper. Uh, and finally, the magnesium chromium sulfide story was also published earlier this year in Materials Horizons. Uh, these are my collaborators. Uh, I did my I did a lot of this work in Professor Gerbrand Sater's lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, here are the experimentalists involved in the sodium cobalt oxide work. Uh, Chris Bartel helped me a lot with the calculations. Uh, he's a postdoc now in the Seder group. And Professor Akira Muda is an experimentalist uh, from Hokkaido University, a brilliant chemist who designed a lot of the experiments that uh, drove these last two papers. Uh, this work was previously supported in an EFRC titled uh, Center for Next Generation Materials by Design, Incorporating Metastability. But now I'm going to continue this work uh, in a DOE Early Career Award that I just got this year, uh, and it's titled Temperature Time Transformation Diagrams for Predictive Solid State Ceramic Synthesis. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm sure that there are some time for questions, and so I'm happy to take those now. Okay, thank you.